Mark Levy, and I'm the co-creator of Chamber Magic. Uh, known Steve for 11 years. And before I start getting into the meat of my speech, I want to ask you guys a few questions. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. I'm going to talk low. <laughs> so, so Chamber Magic started here in the year 2000, right? In the National Arts Club. Who here in the room, with a show of hands, saw Chamber Magic here in the National Arts Club in the year 2000? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Just two. Three. And me. Oh, you mean right. Okay. You weren't born, so you can't pretend. <laughs> and then in the year two thousand in the year two thousand and one, it moved up down uptown to the Waldorf Towers on 50th and Park. Who here has seen Chamber Magic at the Waldorf Towers in the past nine years? Let's see. It's interesting, Steve, stand up, let's see. What do you think percentage of the audience? I'm just interested, stand up. 50%. 50%, okay. And now the final question, before I get to my much-awaited speech, is those of you who have seen Steve perform either 10 years ago, or five years ago, or even last night, or if you're Dick Cavett five minutes ago, what, right, what, that was a rib shot. Yeah. What, what trick stands out most for you from what Steve did? Let's hear from some of you. What trick did you see him do? Yes, miss. The book in which he can tell what the word is. Yes, miss. Oh, drinks out of the same herb. That's for the crematorium. Yes, thank you. What else? What's another trick? Yes, miss, back there. The beverage one. The beverage one, right. Oh, the tea cup. Everyone wants a tea cup. Yes. The rings. The rings. Oh, my God. The rings. The licking finger rings. Great. What else? What's something? Yes, sir. The rising card from the deck. There you go. It was worth all that practice just for that one. Gentlemen. Thank you. So I appreciate hearing from all you guys. Because I'm a behind-the-scenes guy, so what I remember is much more likely to be stuff that went wrong, or stuff that almost went wrong, or just odd situations that Steve had to perform. So I'll give you an example. A few years ago, Steve had to perform for the Queen of Morocco, and he took his deck of cards, and he shuffled his deck of cards, and he put it down on the table in front of the queen and said, Your Majesty, please shuffle the deck of cards. And she motioned to the person standing next to her, which was a guy in a big red fez with a white linen shirt. And he came forward, and he shuffled the deck. And he put the deck back down, and he went back to his spot. And now Steve knew he was in big trouble. Because for the trick to work um, theatrically, it was imperative that the queen herself handle the deck of cards. But apparently, she wasn't going to do that. Either she wasn't allowed to, she didn't want it, whatever it was. And so Steve, being the performer he is, confronted the queen right then and there. He said to her, your majesty, you're the queen. The magic happens from within you. You're the one who creates miracles. If other people touch the deck of cards, the miracles will not happen. We need you to work your magic. Your majesty, please, I would like you to take the deck of cards and cut them into four piles. And there was a long, pronounced silence. <laughs> and the queen reached over, and she cut the deck into one, two, three, four piles, and now Steve said, Your Majesty, please turn over the top card of the first pile that you cut to. And she turned over the card, and it was a queen. The queen had cut to a queen. Your Majesty, turn over the top card of the second pile you cut to. It too was a queen. The third pile, a queen. The fourth pile, a queen. The Queen of Morocco had cut to the four queens. The magic had happened through her, aided by Steve Cohen's little urging of that. So that's a, that's a story. 
Okay. How am I doing, Dick Cathy? Okay, but if he'd have gone ahead without the queen, would he have, she, would he have cut to four servants? <laughs> 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 All right, <laughs> second story that I think of, when I think of these odd places, these odd things he performed, or things that almost went wrong, Steve had to perform for the royal family of Saudi Arabia. And the crown prince of Saudi Arabia was staying in Manhattan. He was, in fact, staying in the Waldorf Towers. He was, in fact, stay he was, in fact staying in the very suite that Steve normally performs chamber magic in, thousands of times. That was the suite that gave the, the crown prince. So they said, Steve, would you like to perform for the crown prince of Arabia? And there were about 15 other princes with him. And Steve said, sure. And rather than sending him straight up there, they took him to another room, the head of protocol, and they gave him the guidelines. They said, you can't do X, you can't do Y, you can't do Z, you can't turn your back on the crown prince. And especially, you cannot get within 10 feet of the crown prince. And the head of protocol used his toe and he made a line on the carpet saying, Prince, 10 feet, you can't get beyond. So Steve said, no problem. He went up to his suite, and when he opened the door of his suite, he was astonished. They had changed the suite. This is the suite he had performed in thousands of times. They had changed the suite to look like the royal palace of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Over the carpet, the carpeting was still there, the regular Waldorf carpet, but they put a pure white carpeting over the entire room, as far as the eye could see. On the wall, there was a portrait of the king. Underneath the portrait of the king was a throne. And along the walls were 15 smaller thrones. And so Steve stood there, the princes all took their seats, the crown prince took the large throne under the king's portrait, and Steve started to perform his show. He stayed about 40 or 50 feet, a respectable distance away from the crown prince, on purpose. He didn't want to let him crunch. So Steve did his first trick for royalty, and nothing happened. There was no response, no one smiled, no one cheered, no one clapped, nothing. Dead silence. Then he did another trick and absolutely nothing happened. Dead silence, no applause, no nothing. And he started to feel flop sweat, like I'm feeling right now up here. He started to feel flop sweat, like the show is going down the tube. He did a third trick, and absolutely nothing happened. There was no reaction. Except, during that third trick, Steve noticed something very interesting. He saw the crown prince was actually squinting to see the trick. And Steve was standing a respectable 40 or 50 feet away. He was doing that because he didn't want to approach, you know, encroach on the, on the prince, crown prince. But he realized that the crown prince couldn't see him from where he was. And if the crown prince couldn't see him, the crown prince wouldn't react. And if the crown prince didn't react, none of the other princes would react. So Steve, on the fly, he threw out some of the tricks he was going to do, and instead he did this on the fly. He went up to one of the princes, and he said, may I borrow a dollar bill? And they gave him a dollar bill, and he folded it up into quarters, and he gave it a, sh he, you know, he shook it, and when he opened up the dollar bill, it had turned into a $100 bill, which he then gave to the prince. And now the crown prince said, do that again. Come, Come closer. Come closer. And so Steve moved up a few princes in the room to another prince, and he took a dollar from one of the princes, he borrowed a dollar, and he folded it up into a square, and he gave it a shake, and when he unfolded it, that dollar too had turned into a hundred dollar bill, which he gave to the prince. And the crown prince said, do it again, come closer. And now Steve moved up. And now he was almost at that boundary line that he was told under no circumstances do you cross. And so he borrowed a dollar bill from another prince. He folded it up into a square, he gave it a shape, and when he opened it in rapid succession, he turned it from a one to a five to a 10 to a 20 to a 50 to a hundred dollar bill, and he gave it to the prince. And now the crown prince said, 
do it again, come closer. Yeah. And Alistair yeah. stepped over the forbidden line, which he was told, do not step over under any conditions, except the crown prince himself had beckoned Steve to come there. So now Steve was just a few feet away from the crown prince. And he took out five or six singles, and he fanned them, and he put them together. And in a shake, they all instantaneously changed into $100 bills. That gave one of the princes a good idea. One of the princes said, I have a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> Change this. Right? Figuring he's been changing ones to a hundred if I give him a hundred. And so now all the princes were on the edges of their thrones, looking at Steve, waiting to see what Steve would do. So he, even Steve wasn't exactly sure what it was he was going to do. So he took the hundred dollar bill, he folded it up, and he gave it a shake. And when he opened it, he had changed it to one. Right? And he gave it to the prince, and the entire audience, all the princes, erupted in laughter. They were slapping each other's up. They loved it. It was the top thing of the night. And the crown prince himself, at the end of the show, said to Steve, through an interpreter, he said, Give me your address. I want to drive a truck of one dollar bills. <laughs> so I remember that. <laughs> Am I still doing okay, Dick Cabot? Oh, man. Right, good. Right, right. Uh, I'll tell you one more story. Um, interesting story. Uh, Andre Previn and Anne-Sophie Mutter, the famous violinist, um, Steve had performed with them many times at chamber magic at private parties, but Anne-Sophie Mutter was giving a private, uh, she was giving a concert in Switzerland and she wanted Steve to perform after dinner, right after the concert. So, <coughs> pardon me, she hired Steve, she flew Steve over to Switzerland, they flew over Steve's family, Yumi and the kids, they flew him over, they watched Anne-Sophie Mutter perform. There's a fireworks show over the lake celebrating Anne-Sophie Mutter's music, and it wasn't like bottle rockets, it was Ferrucci Brothers type, you know, like giant explosions. And so now they went back to the mansion, and they all ate dinner, and now it was Steve's turn to perform. And he was a little nervous, just a little, because fireworks, you know, concert violinists, standing ovations, he wanted to up the ante a bit. He wanted to do something really special. So he did a show, and they loved it. But near the end of his show, he did a trick that he had never done before. And as a matter of fact, when we talked about it ahead of time, neither of us were certain it would actually work. And so here's what Steve did. He picked up a violin, he picked up a bow, and he said to Anne-Sophie Mutter, you are one of the great violinists in the world, but now I would like to play a piece of music for you. And everyone looked around, they were saying, what? You play the violin? Can you play well enough to play for Anne-Sophie Mutter? And Steve said, no, no, you, you don't understand. I don't really play that well. As a matter of fact, I'm quite terrible. But I'm just inspired by the surroundings. So I figured that I would try this. So Steve held the violin up on his shoulder, he took the bow, and he started to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And he played a horrible version of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And as he was playing, suddenly everyone heard a sharp, discordant sound and a kind of recoil at the violin. And so they're looking around like, what just happened? Steve took his hand away from the bow, and the bow stayed there. And then he took the violin off his shoulder, and he held it up to the audience, and the hairs of the bow and the strings in the violin had become intermeshed. Solid penetration, solid through solid. You could not get the bow and the violin undone. He gave it to Anne Sophie Mutter. She tried to get it undone. She could not. To this day, she still has that violin and bow and is still enjoying it. And it's a memorable moment from a very memorable day. So I could I've known Steve for eleven years. I have eleven years of stories if you have the time. But uh, I won't go into eleven years of stories. I just want to thank you for listening me listening to me right now. And Steve, for 11 years, has been my best friend, and I can't think of a better best friend. And I hope that we're best friends 60 years from now, although I plan on outliving you, so we'll see how that works. Uh, uh, but you deserve every accolade you ever get. Thank you so much.